become involved in this new program basically to address the, the needs of SDI TDI members. And one of the focuses of that program is, um, is because there was a definite need on an international basis for, for this type of coverage. I mean, primarily in North America and Canada and Australia, but with, within the rest of the world as well. And there, there aren't any programs out there that are actually addressing that need right now, and that's why we got involved in that. Uh, again, I mentioned Canada, North, uh, Canada, U.S., North America, uh, Australia, and the rest of the world. We're, we're um, basically operating in the United States using a, a partnership with a retail broker there called Johnson Kendall Johnson in Pen Pennsylvania, and in Canada using a, a partner broker called Access Insurance Managers. And in Australia, we're going to be working with a group called OS Brokers or uh, Uniba in Australia. And the Australian program is we're hoping to have that launched uh, sometime before the, um, the current renewal over there in September. We are also going to be able to offer coverage on a, on a global basis through uh, individual retail brokers in the Caribbean, South America, places like that. Um, again, few teething problems when we're starting the program, but, but we will be able to roll it out across the globe at some point in time. So what policies are available? We're going to be talking about those later on in the program and we'll do a frequently uh, um, asked questions session later on as well. We're going to be doing this over one hour. Um, qu we will answer your questions. You, you can use the chat box on the, um, the right-hand side of your screen to pass questions on. We're anticipating an awful lot of questions, so we may not get to them all during the, uh, the uh, presentation itself, but we will follow up with uh, any unanswered questions um, after the, the uh, presentation. You already know that your microphones are muted. So just um, post your questions in the question box and um, send it on off, and we will deal with it as soon as we can. Uh, we are recording the webinar, so you can we will be able to uh, share it later on in the program. So down to the brass tacks here. The uh, insurer for the new program is a, a, a group of syndicates at Lloyd's of London, um, and that is... Um, uh, pretty darn solid security when it comes right down to it. Uh, Lloyd's has been around for 300 plus years and the syndicates we're using are extremely uh, well recognized and, and well secured syndicates. Is coverage available everywhere? Uh, yes, it will be uh, at some point in time. As I said, currently it's uh, available in Canada. Uh, we're not offering coverage in Quebec. Uh, unfortunately, they're their rules and laws and requirements uh, just don't, don't make it a viable proposition in Quebec at this particular point in time. For example, all of their policies have to be in French. And uh, you have to use a different kind of law there. You can't use common law, which we use in the rest of the uh, United States and Canada and, and most of the world, in fact. Um, it is going to be available in, the, it is available in the U.S. right now through Johnson, Kendall, Johnson. And it will be available outside of U.S., Canada, and Australia. Um, through a local licensed retail insurance broker. What limits of liability coverage are available? This is a hot topic because we've decided not to offer a $1 million uh, policy anymore to anybody in the diving industry. And the, the primary, well, there's many reasons for that, but I'll get into those later. Uh, we do have within our contract uh, up to $10 million available for individual instructor liability, for you know, dive shop, general liability, uh, vessel liability, et cetera. Um, so we can write up to $10 million within the existing program. And we do have access to $50 million um, through other sources to add on to this particular type of coverage. Uh, coverage is available now in Canada and the United States. Um, and it will be available in September in Australia. And it uh, will be available well, it is available now outside of uh, North America through independent retail insurance brokers, but it's a little complicated getting it done. If you're outside of the United States uh, and Canada and do have a need for coverage, you can get your uh, retail broker to contact us, and we'll work with him to, to try and put that together for you. So back to the $1 million versus $2 million question. We've had a lot of people uh, calling and asking about this, and, and uh, it is the major change in this program i.e. not offering a $1 million policy anymore. The, the reality is that over the last, well, I would say over the last 10 years, uh, dealing with claims, particularly in the United States, the, 
it, it has become extremely obvious to us that a $1 million policy is just not enough to handle the typical claims that we're seeing. Um, here's an uh, example of some recent claims in excess of a million dollars. Uh, many of you won't be familiar with these because, of course, the, the, uh, the legalities of these cases kind of prevent us from discussing them in public. And, of course, the training agencies don't particularly want to reveal that sort of information as well. But these are all cases that are either ongoing now or have recently been settled. Tuval versus Patty and a bunch of other participants in that case involved the, the, the fatality of a 12-year-old participating in a Discover scuba diving program. And the, um, the demands in that case have you know, bounced all around the place. I believe the last formal demand was for $3.6 million. The difficulty with a case like that, of course, is that if the, the people that are involved are only carrying a $1 million policy and the demand is $3.6 million, the um, instructor and dive facility in this particular case are on the phone very quickly going, well, I've only got a $1 million. They're demanding 3.6. What happens if they get their $3.6 million? Well, the problem is that right at that particular point in time, the insurance company has the option of saying, wow, we've got a million dollar policy here. It looks bad. It looks like we're going to lose this if we go to trial. We'll just tender our million dollars and wander off. And then the individual instructor or dive facility says, well, if the insurance company pays their million, what happens then? Well, the reality is, is you're still being sued. The insurance company has paid its million dollars. It's fulfilled its obligation to you and it walks away and you take over your defense costs and you end up fronting the or, or paying for any excess liability verdict that comes out at the end of that, that trial. Now in these cases, the Tuval case, for example, Willis was insuring the, uh, the, uh, individual, the retailer and the individual instructor and I was involved in that case until my departure from Willis. And we convinced the underwriters that this was a winnable case, i.e. The, um, the allegations were incorrect, they were false, it was defensible, it, um, it wasn't going to cost $3.6 million at the end of the day. The difficulty is that now, this happened in 2011, the case is still ongoing, the expenses have, have risen way beyond a million dollars, and the insurance company at this particular point in time is wishing that they simply paid their million dollars and walk away. I mean, I don't know that they're wishing that, but that would be my assumption. They've um, They've gone way, way down the road, and they're, they're not going to get out of this very lightly. Um, Terry Skiles versus Divewright, Jurgensen Marine Analytical Industries. Uh, 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 Wes Skiles was a friend of mine. I'm sure many of you people knew him as well. He, uh, he died on a rebreather dive. He was uh, diving solo alone on a rebreather that he was not trained on. And it's one of those unfortunate things that happen. Uh, within the you know explore, exploratory sort of niche in our our industry, uh, his wife decided that she needed to sue everybody involved there, and uh, that particular case is rapidly generating all kinds of expenses as well. The next one, DeWolf versus Kohler, involved a, uh, a dive on the Andrea Doria, uh, where Mr. Kohler passed away. Um, I mean, sorry, Mr. Wolf, DeWolf passed away. Um, Kohler was the uh, the instructor supervising the activity. Um, that went all the way to trial. Um, it was won at trial. There was a, a defense verdict at the trial. However, the plaintiffs said, have appealed that, and it's uh, actually still ongoing. The expenses in that case are well up there. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the next one, McCaslin versus Trailborg, a multi-million dollar verdict. Um, Delise and Hall um, are a, a set of plaintiff's attorneys operate out of uh, Louisiana that are focusing on dive industry cases and they have several uh, excess of one million dollar settlements out there. Uh, drives versus Alaska Mining and Diving, that was a, a dry suit training course that went bad and uh, that was a confidential multi-million dollar settlement. Uh, a lot of you are, are familiar with drifting Dan Carlock in California who was left uh, adrift at sea for five hours but was recovered and he sued all of the people involved and he won 1.68 million dollars. Uh, and the recent one, which has put a, a fairly major scare into many people in the dive industry, is Atkins versus Big Dipper Charters, which was in Florida and involved a, a dive boat that um, accidentally backed over two of its divers and, and caused some very significant injuries. 
the demand in that case for, was for 20 million plus and it settled oh, just a couple of weeks ago for 12 million. And the question one, one has to ask is, what is the operator who is involved in that settlement going to do to get the $12 million out of there? Because his insurance company is only on there for whatever the policy face limit is on their policy. For all of these reasons and a bunch of others, we've decided that we can't in good conscience uh, offer anybody a $1 million coverage. Uh, we're seeing pretty much 80 to 90 percent of all the claims out there having demands for excess of one million dollars and and the reality is that if we if we sell people a one million dollar policy we put them in the position okay, okay. The where um, the demand goes to three or four million dollars and the insurance company has an option to pay the million dollar face coverage on the policy and walk away and leave the insured holding the, um, the bag so to speak and, and we just don't believe that we can do that to be honest, we feel that uh, that a five five million or more limit is uh, is actually more appropriate for people in the diving industry. I know everybody's going to freak out and go, "What about the costs for things like that?" When we were putting this program together, we anticipated the the sort of response on, uh, you know, if I've got to pay two million dollars, or if I've got to buy two million dollars, how much is it going to cost me? And we've we've based our program using two million as the primary coverage limit. And we've we've managed to structure the premiums so that they're extremely competitive. I mean, if you go buy one million from one of the other programs, it's going to cost you around six hundred plus dollars. Yeah. If you buy two million on our program, it's going to cost eight hundred plus dollars. If you buy five million, it's going to cost you around nine hundred to a thousand, depending on what you're doing. And if you buy ten million, it will cost you about twelve hundred dollars. So we've tried to make the upper level options available at uh, at reasonable prices. You can still buy one million on, on the other programs, and if you uh, you feel that that's enough, then you're certainly able to go do that. But we're not going to provide you with a million dollars. Um, I'm getting some feedback from some of the other uh, uh, speakers there. Um, I'm going to try and get them to tone it down, but um, anyway, are higher limits of liability available? Yes. Uh, five to ten million makes more sense to us, and it is very affordable under the new program. And as far as we're concerned, two million should be considered the absolute minimum acceptable in the industry. Interestingly enough, in Australia, the minimum required coverage for for you know dive facilities to operate there right now is ten million, and they are telling us that it is going up to twenty million sometimes sometime in the future. So if you're if you're sitting there looking at our uh, are offering and, and contemplating whether you need the $2 million coverage, my answer has to be yes, you absolutely need a minimum of $2 million for this type of activity in the United States these days. One of the other things we've done with our website is um, through Johnson, Kendall Johnson and Access Insurance Managers in, in Canada is we allow anybody that goes in there, individual dive leader, can go in, fill in the application, you can select the options, the $2 million, Three million, five million, ten million, whatever you want. You can go back and forth. You can you know, add coverages, take coverage off, and it will give you a premium summary at the end of it. So you can actually go in there, take a look, determine what your needs are, decide whether you can afford it or not, uh, and make a make an informed choice. And the same thing with facilities. Um, facility can go in, pick their limits for general liability, pick their limits for the the underwater liability in there. Uh, back and forth. Um, I think you'd be really surprised at, at how inexpensive it is to get higher limits of coverage, i.e. five or ten million dollars. It is a it is a real bargain and it is real protection. We we all hate insurance and we don't like to buy it. We don't think we're ever going to need it. But the one day that something really really bad happens and you're facing a lawsuit and somebody is demanding three or four million dollars from you and you realize that you've only got a million dollars coverage on your policy, that's the day you're going to wish you paid a little bit more attention, unfortunately. And I don't want to be a, you know, a, a aggressive insurance salesman, but um, you, you really do have to think about that. The whole point of uh, insurance is to save your assets in your business if and when the bad thing happens. And, um, uh, I mean, that's really what you're trying to prepare for. Buying a $1 million limit of coverage and then having a, an accident that uh, results in a $3 million lawsuit is not going to save your business because somebody's going to have to come up with the shortfall and it's going to be you and it means somebody else is going to be owning your boat, your dive facility, or your house. Anyway, that's um, 
pretty much all we're going to say about the limits. Uh, I think that it's pretty clear to us, and I think it's pretty clear to the majority of people out there. Uh, the, the people that have been calling in have uh, have uh, expressed their sort of gratitude at being able to get better coverage for a reasonable price. Is there an individual dive leader policy available? Yes, there is. Um, are there facility package policies available? Yes, there is. On our facility package, you can buy property, you can insure your buildings, you can insure your uh, business interruption, you can uh, insure all of those things, but you do not have to. Um, you don't have to buy the contents, you don't have to buy the business interruption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You work your way through our website and you can pick whatever you want. Uh, dive vessel package policy, yes, there is a, a, a vessel policy available. And again, you can add uh, the underwater liability coverage to that as well uh, as on the facility uh, package policy. Uh, you don't have to take that either. You can you can buy a dive vessel policy without the underwater liability if you want. So there are a lot of options, and um, I'd suggest you just go to the website and and uh, play around and see what's available. Will the first dive insurance program cover me if I teach other training programs? Yes, we've uh, we've uh, put together a list there, and it is available on our website as well. If you are uh, um, active status SDI TDI a member, you can also teach uh, programs through the other training agencies that are list, listed and you'll be fully covered for those activities. Technical coverage, yes, we have a couple of options for technical coverage. Our technical coverage A covers uh, uh, deep air, it covers trimix and things like that, and our technical option B covers rebreather re re training. Um, can instructors be covered under a dive center or dive vessel policy? Yes, they can. Uh, they are only, however, covered for the activities that they conduct on behalf of that dive center or dive vessel policy when they're covered under that policy. If an instructor works for a dive, uh, dive center or dive vessel, he can be covered under their policy, but if he goes out and he does his own stuff on the side, uh, private courses, things like that, he does need his own personal policy for, for those activities. Um, there are people that aren't teaching until later in the year. Um, there is a non-teaching coverage option available, sustaining status um, uh, policy, but I'd highly recommend against using that. Um, I haven't actually taught an active entry level course since about 1996 myself, but I still carry sustaining status coverage because um, you're out in the, in the general public diving with people, uh, you're considered a, a professional or an expert, and you'll be expected to respond like one in the event of an incident. And if you don't have this type of coverage, um, you're, you're going to be you know, kind of running bare on the whole thing. If you're planning on teaching, you should, you should carry your teaching coverage, and you should maintain that on a continuous basis. Um, renew it on time just to maintain that, uh, that continual coverage. Uh, is additional insured protection available? Yes, you can add um, swimming pools, YMCAs, uh, dive shops, dive vessels, government entities, um, you know, the, uh, the parks, uh, uh, parks people that are letting you have access to their lakes, etc. All of those people can be added as additional insureds. Uh, you can add them online while you're applying for your coverage, and you will get a certificate for them um, when your policy documents are, uh, are produced. Uh, yes, you can apply for coverage online. In fact, online is the only way we're, we're taking applications at this particular point in time. Um, typically, we are trying for a 24-hour turnaround. Um, there is that, that historical June 30th renewal period that causes everybody grief, which we're, we're trying to ignore. Um, you can buy a policy from us anytime during the year, and it will run 12 months. You know, it, we would try to ignore June 30th. It doesn't have any relevance for us, except that we're very busy. So right now, we're trying to turn around quotes, quotes within 24 hours. We're definitely getting them out within a few days. Uh, the effective dates of your policy can be any date you you choose, um, but you want to obviously pick the, the same date that your current coverage is expiring on, and uh, you'll be notified in your quote and in your policy documents. You do, renew, you do need to renew your policy prior to the expiry date of your existing or old policy to maintain continuous coverage. We do have a premium financing package available, and in fact, it is, it's very competitive. Um, when you go online to, uh, to complete an application and get a quote from us, if you decide that you like our price and you're going to buy the, the coverage, you go online again and you, you say, I want to buy this, and, and it, will, it will give you an option of paying it in full or paying a 10% down payment um, 
plus whatever taxes, et cetera, are applicable. And then there is a, a financing package uh, that allows you to pay the balance of the premium over 10 months uh, on equal payments. And, and whichever retail broker you're dealing with, uh, Axis in Canada or Johnson, Kendall Johnson in, uh, in the U.S., is going to put that financing package together for you. We've arranged the financing through an outfit called First Insurance Funding, which operates on a global basis. And they've given us a very, very attractive um, finance uh, interest rate, which is better than any of the other programs that are out there. And uh, we only need a 10% down payment. And most of the other programs require 25 or 30% down. So yeah, it's a very good premium financing package. Refunds available if you cancel your policy? Not for individual dive leaders. That's a, that's a claims made policy um, and, and it is not cancelable and there is no refund on that. On uh, dive facility policies or dive vessel policies, there's normal cancellation conditions. If you sell your vessel, you sell your dive shop or go out of business or anything like that, yes, you can cancel that policy and you get a proportionate refund back once you do that. Um, can you use your existing insurance broker to access this coverage? Um, at, at this point in time in Canada and the U.S., we're only accepting applications through um, Access in Canada and Johnson Kendall Johnson in, in the U.S., but if you're in the Caribbean, South America, anywhere else like that, you can have your, your local insurance broker approach us for coverage. Again, we're trying to deal with the June 30th influx for Canada and the U.S., and, and it's difficult for us to to deal with out of the country um, brokers right now, but we are doing it. Um, we're, we're working with several brokers in the Caribbean right now to put covers together for, for June 30th um, for people that are also on the uh, kind of being um, non-renewed by the old Willis program. Can you use other dive training organizations, medical waiver and release forms for training? Yes, you can. In fact, you, you should or must use them for the specific program that you're teaching. So if you are doing, for example, a PADI DSD program, you do have to use PADI DSD materials, waivers, and releases, and things like that. That's uh, mandatory. Oh, your policy last year was with Willis. What do I do to protect myself from prior acts? Well, that's a, the whole Willis thing was a, a very, very, very sad state of affairs. Um, I could... I don't actually know why they canceled their program because I departed uh, prior to that. But the, the reality is that the diving insurance is very difficult. The claims are hard to manage. They are very expensive. I guess they just decided that it wasn't worth their while um, to remain in, the, in the, uh, the dive insurance business. But what they've done is left a lot of people with, with some concerns out there. And if you were a Willis insured, our advice to you is to sit down, take a pad of paper, and write down Deal with your, you know, talk to your staff if you're a facility, your vessel uh, uh, crew, etc. Make a running list of any and all incidents or activities that that uh, caused you any concern during the year, and put together an incident list of things that, you know, may come back to bite you at some point in time, and send that off to Willis and and uh, report them as incidents that you think may have some potential to to um, uh, lead to a claim at some point in time. And once you get that list to them, uh, they provide it to the underwriters. And uh, once they have notice, then you are protected for claims in the future that arise from any of those incidents. So that's our, our suggestion to anybody out there that is concerned about something that may have happened in the, in the, in the past number of years that um, may come back to haunt them. If you provide the, uh, the Willis program with uh, notice of those incidents, then they will be considered, um, um, how would you say, uh, notified to the underwriters and you will have protection for those incidents going forward. Okay, that was pretty fast actually. So I think um, what we're going to do now is, um, Sean, can we take a look at some of the questions? Is that an option for us now? Uh, it is, Peter. I've been doing my best to keep up with all the questions. There are several on there. Um, I can list off some if you'd like, and, and you can respond to them. Sure, that, uh, that works. Uh, w one question that just came in from John Conway was, is the additional insured automatic like it was in the past, or do we have to uh, spell them out? Uh, yes, it, it is automatic, just like in the past. Um, and what I mean by automatic is the, the, uh, the way the policy wording has been constructed is that it clearly defines the, 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 the places that an individual instructor might be conducting his training, i.e. a dive facility, 
uh, governments, swimming pools, you know, YMCA, things like that. All of those entities are automatically uh, protected as additional insureds under the, the standard policy wording. So no, you don't need to list them to, to protect them. However, we have seen in the past that many of these facilities just, you know, they don't trust that sort of thing. And, and some of the other programs uh, have always, I mean, we've seen claims in the past using on other programs, again, I won't mention any names, where they specifically say if you're not listed, you're not covered. So we've developed a, a bit of an air of paranoia out in the industry there as well. So what we've done is, is we've actually, uh, uh, as part of the application process, allowed you to add additional insureds. Um, uh, for those people that want to see paper with their name on it. So the answer to the question is, yes, it is automatic. Those places are protected, uh, regardless of whether they're listed or not. But yes, you can list them, and we will produce a certificate for them uh, if they want to see their, their name in, in, in writing. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to go back up and uh, look at some of the older ones before I get to the new ones. There was one from Patrick, and his question was, just to confirm, insurance does not cover negligence, i.e., the courts determine that an instructor was acting outside standards and practice, so the insurance company has no liability. Yeah, not correct. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice thought, and, 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 and to be honest, there have been cases in the past where an instructor has behaved so egregiously that we wish we could say, no, you can't, uh, you know, we don't have any obligation to defend you. I'm saying we on, on behalf of the insurance company. Uh, we, the, the, uh, the underwriters in this case, and the brokers, i.e. I. Johnson, Kendall, Johnson, and Axis, do not make any decisions with respect to you know, the, the um, suitability or viability of a claim. That's not our job. Our job is to try and get the insured the best protection they can. But the courts have, um, well, I'll give you an, an example. Uh, and Sean, you're familiar with this one. We had a TDI instructor on the East Coast some years ago who, who took a, a student all the way through from, I believe it was, well, I don't think it was his open water, but he did some advanced training with this guy. And he took him through about four or five courses all the way to, uh, deep air, I believe, and uh, he was diving in a a, um, uh, a major uh, springs area, I forget, uh, 40 Fathom Grotto, I think. Anyway, lost this guy at uh, some incredible depth, um, allowed him to escape to the surface, uh, serious embolism, serious DCS, and basically ruined the guy's life. He was a cripple forever. And when we, when we uh, examined the the um, facts of the case once a lawsuit was, was filed, we, we knew the facts of the case prior to that because we got an incident report, of course, but we found that this instructor had never had this student complete a waiver agreement. Um, he had some medical issues that would have um, disqualified him from this training. He never had him complete a medical form. He never had him do any of that, that um, you know, pre-programmed stuff that you're supposed to do. Um, the no waiver was a very big thing because, of course, it, uh, it created all kinds of grief for the defense in that case. That's the only time we've, we've uh, in the history of the Willis program anyway, uh, thought to ourselves that, you know, really, this instructor doesn't deserve to be defended. But you still have to provide a defense. There's, there's you know, a very huge obligation under any insurance policy to provide a defense for your insured in the event that they're, they're, they're sued. Um, for anything, pretty much, because the things you're sued for are allegations. They're not proven correct. So the insurance company can't really deny anything in advance until the allegations are actually proven correct. If the allegations are proven correct and it shows that you, you did violate standards, et cetera, then, then you may have a bit of an issue. But, but that is not going to happen at the beginning of, of any lawsuit. The obligation for your defense is definitely there. Um, just to finish off that particular example, the insurance company did file what they call a declaratory judgment action in a federal court, uh, trying to get a judge to rule that they did not have to provide um, defense for this particular instructor because he had breached, in addition to a bunch of other stuff, he breached, uh, well, the, 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 the waiver standard, the medical standard, uh, the depth limitation standards, moving on to other programs without completing the prior ones, et cetera. There's about 25 things this guy did wrong. It's, it's the worst case I've ever seen in my life. But by the time the federal court heard the uh, insurance company's uh, you know, declaratory judgment action, the case had already been running for three years, and there was a settlement by all parties. So that's the reality. I mean, the unfortunate reality is that 
yes, if you do breach standards, you are likely still going to get defense, and you're likely still going to be protected by the insurance company, even if, frankly, you don't deserve it because of your behavior. I think that answers the question, Sean. Uh, I, I would say it does, and yes, I am familiar with that case. Um, <laughs> so the, the next one we have, Peter, is from Darren, and his question was, uh, if a charter service or instructor from the U.S. goes to Australia, are they required to tempor temporarily uh, I'm thinking set up the minimum coverage limits while they're uh, while in their respective country. Yeah, so somebody well, let's use a simple case. Scuba instructor in the United States takes a group to Australia to go diving. Um, unless he is actually operating a business in Australia, uh, they don't really need to change anything. The coverage that an individual dive leader has got in, in the United States is global coverage. The coverage applies everywhere in the world. Um, unless he is sued by an Australian over there, there really isn't anything to worry about. And even then, um, an Australian suing an American would have to do so in Australia, likely. Um, I, I can't even imagine a circumstance where, where somebody who was in Australia visiting would be restrained from leaving there and going back to the United States. I mean, you'd end up back in the United States and whoever was trying to sue you in Australia would have to come to the United States to do it. So I don't think that's a concern for anybody. Uh, if, you're, if you're a dive leader, a dive facility, you're taking a, a group to Mexico and something happens in Mexico, it's likely going to be one of, one of your passengers or one of your participants that is, is going to try and and sue you, and that's going to take place back in the United States. So, uh, again, you really don't have to worry about that sort of circumstance when you're traveling around. If you go to Australia and you set up a business there, um, incorporated or whatever, and you you begin operating in Australia, then you're going to have to deal with uh, the local sort of rules, regulations, restrictions, and, and uh, you, you'd likely have to buy the type of coverage that everybody else carries over there. I think that answers that one. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, the next one we have is from Reese, and his question is, if the dive facility provides the underwater liability insurance for its instructors and dive masters, is it acceptable legal to charge them back for a portion of the insurance? Example, if they purchased their own policy and it cost them 600 and we charge them 200 to be under our policy? Yeah, that's a that, that's a bit of a um, it's a bit of a gray area. Um, when we were uh, with the Willis program, we we did get some legal opinions on that, and the reality is is that yes, you can you can make any sort of arrangement with your staff that you want internally. Uh, you cannot sell them insurance per se because only a, a licensed insurance broker is allowed to sell anybody insurance. Um, but but you can make any sort of remuneration agreement that you want with your staff. I mean, you can you can uh, you know charge them uh, wholesale for their equipment if you want. You can have them participate in your expenses if you want. You can have them participate in profit sharing if you want. As, as long as you don't call it selling insurance and you don't specifically say that you're selling them insurance because you're not. Then, then you can make any sort of internal arrangement you like. We don't particularly care for that because we think that uh, you know a business that is, well, let's put it this way. If you were a hardware store employee, you wouldn't buy your own hardware store employee's insurance. You'd go to work for the hardware store, and the hardware store would buy coverage that protects them and their employees for liability that they may incur while they're acting on behalf of their employer. And that's the way the rest of the world works. So it, it seems that that's the way the diving industry should work as well. I mean, we've got some, some historical precedent there because, you know, back in the 60s, there were very few dive retailers and everybody was a scuba instructor. And uh, the insurance started out being individual dive leader insurance. That is not the best way for a facility to protect itself, though. And, and I'll give you a quick example since we have a little bit of time. Several years ago, we had a facility in Hawaii that did not buy um, our underwater liability coverage as part of their facility package. They bought the normal, for those days, facility insurance package, which insured your, you know, your stock, your customer's goods, your compressors, your furniture fixtures, rental gear, stuff like that, and your general liability, uh, i.e. the product liability for you know, failure of a, equipment that you've sold or serviced or rented or you know, a bad gas bill or something like that. And they depended on 
their individual dive staff members to carry their own insurance um, to protect them for the, the, the training activities. Um, this particular case, it was a, a PADI instructor who was carrying his insurance through the PADI program, but it, it would have been the same for any of the other insurance programs. What happened is the, the instructor did uh, an introductory type scuba program, um, finished with the student, the student left, or the participant left, went back to his hotel and had a heart attack in the elevator going up to his room. This is a true story, you can't make these things up. The, um, the instructor didn't know about it, the facility didn't know about it, and about six months later, the, uh, the legal documents arrived. They were sued. Um, the facility was sued by the, uh, the family of the, the, the deceased. He died from the heart attack. And uh, they were alleging that the activity was too aggressive. In other words, there was surf and there was current. And um, the, the, the instructor that was leading the, the group or the, doing the, the tour um, was too aggressive with the with the participants and and basically caused this guy's heart attack by overworking him. So the facility called us and and reported the uh, the incident in the lawsuit and um, basically said, you know, how do we deal with this um, going forward? And um, um, we said the unfortunate part is you're relying on your um, on your uh, uh, instructor's policy to provide your defense for. Um, the um, underwater liability exposure portion of that whole thing. So the, um, the only thing the facility could do was actually go and try to track down the instructor to get him to file a claim under his insurance at the time. Well, the instructor had given up teaching scuba diving, had not reported the claim, had moved to Australia, and consequently there was no coverage under that policy because they hadn't filed a report with their insurer and the facility was on its own. That's why facilities really need to carry the actual uh, underwater liability themselves. That way they don't have to worry about you know, Bob the scuba instructor for getting to renew his policy on time. They don't have to worry about Frank the scuba instructor getting mad at them, you know, leaving them to go to another shop um, and, and then try to deal with a claim that comes up afterwards. They don't have to worry about, you know, Fred, the scuba instructor, saying that was a minor incident. It was a, you know, it was a close call, but I don't need to file an incident report, et cetera. If they carry the underwater liability coverage as part of their facility or vessel package, they control the, the coverage. They, they, they renew the coverage. They carry it on going forward. Um, on the opposite side of the street, though, if you are an individual instructor working for a dive facility, if that's all you're doing, then you can rest assured that the, the dive facility's policy, assuming they carry the underwater liability, is going to protect you for all of the stuff you do for them. If you do stuff on the side, then you do need your own individual policy. I think that probably addresses that one, Sean. I think so, too. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to pick out, we have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to try to pick out some um, some of the ones that might be a little more tricky and, and might be of interest to others. Uh, sure. This one comes from John, and it's, it asks, uh, what kind of infrastructure is going behind this policy? Will there be dedicated staff to assist, assist dive shops in approval of custom written releases like rentals or training records? Will, the infra will that infrastructure offer any seminars, audits, or any other value added? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, that's a complicated question, a very big one, because of course, uh, you guys at SDITD, I do an awful lot of that stuff yourself. So I mean, you're you're constantly reviewing uh, waivers, legal documents, things like that, and uh, and that is an ongoing process. Uh, yes, if uh, if uh, in fact for for vessel coverages, for example, uh, we we require uh, a copy of uh, current vessel release, dive release, etc., and those are reviewed, and we we do um, you know offer comments on uh, on changing those, making them more appropriate, things like that. The, um, the, the reason we've picked the partners we've got right now, Johnson Kendall Johnson in the United States, are a, 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 um, a very successful uh, insurance brokerage. They do an awful lot of business. They run uh, medical malpractice programs. They're, they're uh, very familiar with the legal system in the United States. They're licensed in every single state in, in the union. Um, Access insurance managers in Canada are, again, they're, uh, they're all across Canada. They do a lot of uh, global and international business. They, um, they know their way around the legal scene. 
the brokers we're using in Australia as well. Uh, it, I should say that JKJ, Axis, and OS brokers, and uh, we're actually going to use three different brokers in Australia because they have a division of regions over there. They're all part of a, a global network called Uniba that is um, you know, not, not the major three brokers in the world. It's, uh, it's sort of the second tier of large broker that works together to, to you know, help each other with their issues in, in uh, different countries. So it's, yeah, the infrastructure here is, is actually quite huge. And the, um, the amount of assistance that we're going to be able to provide people, it, it, teething problems when we're starting out, of course, is going to be very, very significant. Um, we have our Australian partners right now uh, going through all of the wordings, uh, the limits of liability, making sure that compliance works, working, working through uh, you know, waivers, releases, and things like that. So that sort of infrastructure is there. Um, those questions can be answered. There is going to be advice available for people. And uh, really, all you need to do is send, a, send an email to either JKJ or Axis. Um, they'll pass that through to First Dive and Owl. And, um, and we will get back to pretty much anybody on anything uh, as soon as possible. I think that helps, eh? All right, um, Peter, uh, Sean has had to step out just for a moment, so I'm going to uh, pinch hit, as it were, for him. You can do that, Paul. <laughs> and uh, I'll select out some questions uh, to throw at you. I do want to point out we have a lot of questions. We're not going to be able to get to them uh, all within the next 15 minutes or so. However, we have the ability to print out the attendee list that includes your questions. So we will be able to answer your questions. Uh, it will be through a, um, you know, th through an email in that regard. So, um, we've, Peter, we've got one here from uh, Rod, and the question is flood insurance. Is that available or is it covered under the wave rider? Uh, no, it is not. Unfortunately, in the United States, um, one of the things I didn't mention about the waivers, which, which actually applies, and this reminds me, so I'm going to combine the, the, the sort of two things. Every single state has a different legal environment. Um, waivers that work in one state, i.e. California, don't work in Louisiana. Waivers that work in Florida don't work in Hawaii. So it's very, very complicated. And, and, and that's one of the reasons we require uh, um, copies of waivers for vessel operators and things like that. The same sort of thing applies to flood insurance. Unfortunately, most states do have a flood insurance program, so we have decided not to venture into flood insurance. We do offer a wave action coverage, which is, which is uh, very limited. It's only $15,000, and it typically applies to people that are in areas that are subject to windstorm, um, uh, water driven by windstorm, et cetera, hurricanes, the, the Gulf Coast, the East Coast. Uh, so that is what that applies to, and it is uh, wave driven water coverage. And unfortunately, it's only limited to $15,000, uh, but that does help if you're in one of those areas. For flood insurance, you do have to deal with your local state flood programs. Okay, great. Um, um, we've got two other questions I am going to roll into one question. And the first part is from Nikolai, is defense coverage contingent on filing an incident report when the accident happens? For example, there are lots of little things that happen routinely. Perhaps a student experiences a headache, something like that what should be reported and what shouldn't be reported. And I'm going to roll that into um, uh, the next one from Bob, which is of the settlements that, in cases you were talking about earlier, what role did proper paperwork or lack thereof play in the case? Holy smokes. Those are, um, th th those are very good questions. Um, I'm going to do the first one first, obviously. And that is, what do you report? In my opinion, you report absolutely anything and everything that is out of the ordinary or unusual. Uh, a very good example is our drifting Dan Carlock case in California because, um, and I'll make it very quick, uh, Dan was a diver on a dive boat. Uh, they went to a dive site. Dan went in with everybody else. The dive boat counted everybody back out of the water, checked them in, moved to the next dive site put everybody back in the water again. All the people came out. They didn't have Dan. 
Uh, they alerted the Coast Guard. Coast Guard went looking for Dan. The problem was that Dan actually went missing at the first dive site, not the second dive site, and they missed him. He drifted for five and a half hours, was picked up by a, a, a sailing sail training vessel with a bunch of Boy Scouts on it. They got Dan back, and the operator of the vessel decided that since they got Dan back, they didn't need to report the incident. Well, lo and behold, a year down the road, the uh, the 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 vessel operator and uh, and the facility that brought the group on board the vessel were nailed with a lawsuit. None of them had reported the incident to their insurance carriers, and at least one of the parties had actually switched insurance programs from, from one carrier to the other. But they had not filed the incident report with the prior carrier. So yes, in that particular case, they had a real problem. You, you really do need to report all incidents. The reason this type of coverage is written on a, on a the, the professional liability coverage, the reason it's written on a claims made basis is, is for the same reason that, that um, medical malpractice insurance is written on a claims made basis. The insurance company wants to know about things that are going wrong at the time they go wrong. If we said to the, the scuba instructor, yeah, you don't have to report incidents, you know, we'll just find out when we find out, then we would never know what was facing us down the road. You wouldn't be able to do a, a, an investigation, you wouldn't be able to preserve evidence, you wouldn't be able to prepare to protect the individual that's involved. So that's, that's why claims made coverage exists, and yes, for full protection, you do need to report everything. My favorite incident report was one that I got from a scuba instructor about 10 years ago where he said that one of his students had told him that she was pregnant. And he was reporting that because he, he felt that it was inappropriate for somebody that was pregnant to be learning how to scuba dive. He didn't know that she was pregnant and he was actually filing that incident report. We got a chuckle out of it, but that guy was thinking. I mean, that's the sort of thing that you have to think about. So yes, if a, if a student drops a weight belt on their toe and, and injures their foot badly, you should be reporting that. If somebody has um, a bleeding nose, bleeding ears, um, problems on a scent, anything like that, you should be reporting those incidents. That's the sort of stuff that the training agencies need to know, and it's the sort of stuff that the insurance company needs to build a file on in the event that something comes back to haunt you down the road. And once you, once you report those incidents under a claims made policy, you have coverage for them forever. So yes, you should report everything. If somebody um, um, tears a fingernail, you don't have to report that. Does that help, Paul? I believe it does cover it uh, very good, Peter. And just to remind you on the second part uh, that can oh. tie in, the uh, question was, Paperwork. yeah, of the settlements and cases mentioned earlier, what role did uh, proper paperwork or lack thereof play? Yeah, I'd have to say that the, the lack thereof in, in most of those cases plays a huge role. There is, there is no doubt about it. The, um, and you know, and I'll, I'll say this with a, you know, a, a degree of cynicism, there are a, a lot of participants in this industry that don't pay attention to paperwork. There are a lot that, that have meticulous paperwork. And I can tell you that, that in the event of, of an accident or an incident, when, when you can provide you know, good, clean, solid rental logs and service logs for your equipment and things like that, that plays a huge role. If you, if you uh, turn around and say, well, you know, I mean, I, don't, I, don't, you know, I didn't check the interstate pressure when I serviced that regulator, so I can't tell you what it was, et cetera, et cetera, then you are setting yourself up for a lot of grief. There's, there's no doubt about it. We had a case in California some years ago where a, a solo diver went into a cave chasing a lobster, and he um, he ran out of air in there for whatever reason. Um, his tank was bone dry, uh, or, well, it was actually wet, but it was empty of air when they when they got him back, and and his parents filed a lawsuit against the facility that had serviced his regulator three or four months before. Uh, when we took a look at all of the evidence, it was very, very clear that this guy had gone into the cave alone, got stuck, breathed his, his, his tank dry, and drowned. The parents believed that he was a, a very professional scuba diver and was well trained and was very cautious and, and that it couldn't have been his fault. He wouldn't have done that. There had to be something wrong with his equipment. They hired some some expert witnesses, um, one of them a very, very well known uh, uh, diving celebrity on the West Coast, I will not mention his name, um, and they came up with the, with the theory that the regulator wasn't serviced properly and the, uh, the yoke nut on the first stage wasn't secured properly and that uh, when he was in the cave he must have banged it against the, a rock and dislodged it from the valve 
and allowed all the air to leak out. Anybody that's been involved in the dive industry for a long time knows that that's, that's pretty darn speculative and, and not likely to happen. The difficulty was when, when they went to examine the, the service records from the facility, they found several things. Number one, they weren't actually certified to service that make of regulator. Number two, they did not have a torque wrench for tightening down the, uh, the yoke uh, nut on the first stage. And in the, the manual from the, the manufacturer, it says that you have to tighten down that yoke nut to a certain uh, torque poundage. So the, the question is, well, you, how can you say that you service the regulator properly when you don't even have the equipment necessary to meet the manufacturer's specifications? So yes, in that particular case, the lack of paperwork and, and due diligence was a, 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 a huge factor. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't um, uh, totally limiting in that particular case. We did manage to sit down with the parents in the judges' chambers and explain to them how all of this worked. And the, the case was finally settled at a, I mean, you call it a reasonable amount. It was around 100 grand. But uh, yeah, that's what happens when you, don't, uh, when you don't have the paperwork to back it up. So yeah, paperwork is a, a huge part of that process. And, and you know, if we're, if we're dealing with a claim and we're looking at the paperwork and it, it all makes sense and it looks good, everybody breathes a sigh of release if you get questions uh, back from the, the insured going, uh, well, what do you mean? What, what, what do you want? Yeah, we don't actually uh, use uh, rental release forms. Then you get a little bit nervous. There's no doubt about that. I hope that answers that question. Uh, continuing on uh, about policy for individual versus facility uh, from Chris, how about discount group policies for friends, family? Both my wife and I are DMs currently in an instructor development course, as well as some friends. Are there group or family rates available? Yeah, there are not. and. Um, I mean, frankly speaking, the, the main reason for that is that this is all very complicated already. The, um, you know, different, different uh, levels of coverage, i.e. dive master assistant, instructor, instructor, trying to figure out the, the exposures and, uh, you know, trying to uh, simplify the process as much as, as possible. Frankly, the paperwork involved in getting out an individual instructor's policy uh, has to be automated. Otherwise, you, you just can't do it. So we are limited as to you know how far we can go to complicate the process, and and you know the the real answer here is you're already part of a group, and the and the reason you've got this coverage in the first place is because you're part of that group, and it uh, it takes several thousand people to to put together a group that can qualify for this sort of coverage in the first place. So offering uh, you know a, a couple a discount while it may sound nice and stuff like that is it's just too complicated and. It, and you're already part of a, a much bigger group, um, so it's just not going to work, I'm afraid. And, and and at that point, really, the the option, the best option to look at is a facility policy where you're teaching. Yeah, if if you're actually um, um, teaching and doing some other things, i.e., providing equipment for your students or providing gas fills and things like that, then a facility policy policy does make huge sense. And in fact, the uh, the, the facility policy, I don't want to say it, it offers a discount, but it, it bases the, the premiums that you pay on a, on, a, on, a, on a different sort of schedule. We take a look at your receipts from training, your, your sales receipts apply to your general liability, your receipts from training apply to uh, your underwater liability, and it's no longer uh, um, dependent on how many instructors you have, i.e. there is no particular premium per instructor, it's based on your activities. So a facility, for example, that has four instructors, you know, one of them only, only teaches two or three classes a year, the other one teaches 30 or 40 or 50, all of that is taken into account and, it, and it's uh, based on those numbers, the certification um, issued and stuff like that, as opposed to just a standalone, how much is it for an instructor's policy. So I mean, there is savings available through the facility to answer that question. Well, okay, we're, we're coming up on 2 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time, which is the end, end time of the seminar here. Um, as Sean may have mentioned, and I mentioned uh, for him in his place, that um, all of your questions 
can and will be answered. Uh, however, they just may be answered by email. We'll do a printout of the questions uh, along with the, the asker, and we can get those answers to you. So I apologize for not getting to all of the questions at the, at the time. So at this uh, point, Peter, is there anything, any final remarks uh, perhaps you'd like to, to add? Nope, um, just that uh, if you have any questions, um, go through the uh, the appropriate retail broker for your, your area, uh, Johnson, Kendall Johnson in the U.S., Access in Canada. Um, uh, their websites have links for emails and things like that. Send off a question, and between them and ourselves, we'll make sure that you get an answer to it. And um, thanks, everybody, for participating. I know nobody wants to spend an hour in the middle of the day talking about insurance, except for maybe me, but that's... You know, I, I do appreciate everybody participating. And, we, and thanks, uh, you guys at SDITDI, for putting this together. It's our pleasure. Um, th again, thank you to all for taking the time out of your schedules. Uh, I know we had attendees from around the globe, from Asia Pacific, in, in addition to uh, Europe as well. So thank you for cutting into your sleep time and uh, also into your, your evening. And just as a little reinforcement here about questions, um, just give us a call here at HQ, um, as well as shooting an email to uh, yeah, good Sean, to to Sean. Yeah, TDI. Yep, yep, and we can go from there. So again, thank you very much, and we look forward to uh, all having a good season. Take care. Bye. Bye, bye guys.